Welcome everyone to another seminar of mathematics and high energy physics. Today we have the honor of having Professor Hubert. He did his PhD at the University of Berlin under the supervision of Herbert Kurke. Then he did several postdocs at the Max Planck Institute in Bonn, then at the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton, and then continued with other postdocs. He also was a Marie Curie Fellow in Paris and obtained some faculty positions at the University of Essen, University of Cologne, and since 2005, he is professor at the University of Bonn. Hubert does a research on K3 surfaces and higher dimension analogous, compact, uh, compact hypercolor manifolds and model spaces of cheese on variety. He has made important contributions in complex algebraic geometry. Some of his achievements are he developed a new approach to the classification of K3 surfaces. He proved a conjecture about the existence of the universal family of K3 surfaces. He also studied a compact a hypercolor manifolds. He developed a new method for constructing model spaces uh, of cheese on varieties. Hubert's work has had significant impact in the field of algebraic geometry. He's considered one of the leading experts in the field, and his, in his work has been cited by so many mathematicians. He is also author of one of the most used and famous books in complex uh, geometry called Introduction of Complex Geometry. He has also written several other famous books and several articles on algebraic geometry, like the geometry of model spaces of chips and another book called Clavillao Manifolds and Related Geometries, which co-author with Mark Rose and Dominic Joyce. We are very happy and it's a great honor to have him with us today. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Okay, yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, the kind introduction. It's good to see you. Well, I see only one, but I assume there are, there are faces behind these logos. Um, uh, so uh, I think I, I slightly modified the title. It was algebraic geometry and of killer manifolds. Uh, before I changed this to algebraic geometry and killer manifolds. Um, and uh, and roughly the the uh, the question I'll, I'll discuss won't answer is whether we can actually avoid uh, uh, killer manifolds or whether we have to. Uh, talk about killer manifolds. So I assume uh, that you all followed some class in algebraic geometry. You're all familiar with algebraic varieties, so that you, your interest is really in algebraic geometry. Uh, and and I'll uh, try to explain uh, how to uh, enlarge the category of algebraic varieties. Uh, and somehow that we are forced to do this, but we can do this in a way that we can keep some of the of the techniques we are used to, we are using for algebraic varieties um, to study those. Okay, so uh, it will be a very non-technical talk. I just try to convey ideas. Uh, I don't want to give uh, much, much many proofs. Well, maybe none, but uh, try to convey the main ideas. So the first one is I start out with the something you know, namely the geometry of uh, of equations, um, the geometry with equations. So when you learn algebraic geometry. Uh, unless you do a prop, only an abstract scheme theory class, then you learn about algebraic varieties first. So these are varieties studied by, defined by algebraic equations. Uh, and here I'll be interested in algebraic varieties that are cut out by equations in the projective space. And uh, we walk over, over the complex numbers so because we want to uh, move from algebraic geometry towards complex geometry. So we work, we start with algebraic geometry of C. And uh, we make our lives easier by assuming all kinds of nice properties. In particular, uh, we want the varieties uh, to be smooth and, and, and predictive. And then there's a fundamental principle that goes back to Serre that tells us um, that we can pass to uh, complex manifolds. Uh, so an algebraic variety has comes with its natural Zariski topology. But if you're over C, you can introduce a finer topology. That's the classical analytic topology. And the underlying uh, structure then becomes a complex manifold. A little later, I recall the definition or the main idea of the definition of a complex manifold. Here, at this point, it's just uh, uh, the fact that we can pass from an algebraic variety with a Zariski topology, which is a very coarse topology, to something with a much finer topology, which in particular is a, is a real manifold, but it's actually a complex manifold. And that, that, that runs under the title Gaga, Geometry Algebraic, Geometry Analytique. There's also a way to go back, and I'll come, come 
I'll come back to this uh, in a second. Okay, so and maybe to start with, uh, we can uh, we can look. It's enough somewhat to think of two examples. One is uh, the case of uh, curves or Riemann surfaces. For instance, you could look at uh, at, a, at a plane curve defined by a homogeneous equation like the Fermat equation that cuts out a complex curve in the in the projective plane, and it happens to be uh, happens to be uh, of genus uh, yes, the genus. So for k equals one and two, so that's a line or quadric. That's actually a sphere. That's the Riemann sphere S two. Uh, for k equals three, this number here becomes one. And that's then the the Riemann surface of genus one. So there's always this there was always this confusion because the, between Riemann surface an algebraic curve, okay? Uh, an algebraic curve or the complex number is nothing but the Riemann, Riemann surface. Uh, so here Riemann surface means two dimension over the reals, complex curve means one dimension over the complex. And the second example is, um, is the Fermat uh, quartic. Uh, so we take here, we have the Fermat equation uh, in the projective plane. Here we take a Fermat equation of degree four in P3. And that will define what's known as a K3 surface. This is a very important class of algebraic of surfaces that lives in the middle of the classification in theory. There are three bits only there, uh, two bits, I'm sorry, K3 surfaces and abelian surfaces. Uh, I won't give you the, the, the concrete, um, the, the full definition of a K3 surface. Here's just an example, but later I'll, I'll, I'll mention why K3 surfaces are actually interesting. Um, when talking about passing from complex algebraic surfaces to, to a complex manifold. Okay, so now once we have done this, passing from uh, from an algebraic variety to a complex manifold, we can uh, start studying these algebraic varieties or these complex manifolds by linear algebra tools, uh, and that's uh, that's uh, that's essentially a singular cohomology. Um, so I can look at, uh, so as I told you, I, ca I can pass from X from an algebraic variety to a complex manifold. In particular, that's a topological manifold. It's a topological space. And I can look at its singular cohomology. That's nothing I can do when I have an algebraic variety, say over some field. There's nothing like singular cohomology. You have to deal with other, other cohomology types, cohomology theories like eta cohomology and, and so on. Uh, but once you have the complex number, the numbers you have, uh, you have um, a singular cohomology, and that's so. I, it's, it's important to stress that this is a transcendental invariant. It's not an invariant of the algebraic variety, but it's an invariant of the complex manifold. So, uh, for instance, uh, you can look at the first thing you can do is you can look at the rank of these of these uh, of these uh, singular cohomology groups. So these are these are. Uh, maybe I can write this here. These are uh, finite, finitely generated Z modules. So in particular, they have a rank, and the rank of this is is uh, are the Betty numbers of of the of my uh, variety of manifold. And finally, and that's the most important bit for us here. Uh, this cohomology theory, this uh, singular cohomology here, comes which is which uh, with what is called a Hodge decomposition. So if instead of singular cohomology with integral coefficients, I put complex coefficients. So this just means you take here, you take here uh, tensor C, uh, then you get to this complex vector space. And this complex vector space decomposes uh, into uh, parts that are called H, P, Q of X. And they're just defined to be, uh, to be uh, the cohomology groups um, Homology groups H Q of omega X P. So omega X is the is the cotangent sheaf which you know from the algebraic geometry class, and omega X P that's the pth exterior uh, power of it. And I take cohomology. So this is really an algebraic. I put this here. This is an algebraic invariant. This is an, uh, an algebraic invariant. This can be defined purely in terms of the original variety. Particular, I can define this for any variety of any field. So let's say smooth variety. Um, so there's something again. I, I'm stressing this. This is something transcendental, and this is on the other side. This is something algebraic. And this decomposition has one more uh, one more uh, feature, namely 
that the complex conjugate of the PQ part is the QP part. So what does it mean, this complex conjugate? You see, there's a C here. So this cohomology here was obtained from a Z module tensor C. And on C, you have complex conjugation. And that this is this complex conjugation I'm taking here. And it says, if I take this space complex conjugated, then I get, I get this space. And altogether, this is what's called a, a Hodge structure. Okay, so how is this? How do we get this complex, this Hodge structure? And it starts out uh, very algebraically, namely with the um, with uh, the Dirac complex. So this is the Dirac complex, uh, which in fact can be fine. Um, for any variety again, let's say smooth variety, uh, by just taking the differential from O from the structure sheaf to omega, and then there's the differential from omega to omega two, and so on. Um, for um, for uh, over the complex numbers, it has this additional property, namely that by the Poincaré lemma, this complex here is exact under here, and it, the kernel of this first differential is is the, the constant sheaf uh, of complex numbers. Simply because if you have a function and its differential is zero, that means it's a locally constant function. It's a constant function locally. And, and so this complex here is, uh, that's an exact complex, an exact uh, complex. And this allows you to compute the cohomology of this constant, of the sheaf of, of this constant sheaf C, which is nothing but the singular cohomology with complex coefficients. As the as what is called or used to be called the hypercomology of this complex, and now this complex has a certain filtration. You can imagine that I can can write down here uh, smaller complexes. For instance, I could take um, I could start with omega one uh, and go up to omega n, or I could start with omega two and go up to omega n. And this gives the filtration of this complex, and then there's this yoga of spectral sequences that tells you that this implies what's called the Frölicher spectral sequence. So that's called the Frölicher spectral um, sequence. There's some, there's always a confusing point. So first of all, it's an E1 spectral sequence. Um, and, and then there's this confusing point that the PQ gets mixed up here with the QP. This came in already here that HPQ is HQ omega P. I'll say something about this PQ decomposition a little later on the level of forms, uh, but just to, to stress this, there is a, has to be a little careful here. So what does it mean to have a spectral sequence like this? Well, on the E1 page, it means I have these vector spaces that appear here on the left-hand side. So I've written some of them, H0, H0, H10, H20, and so on. And I have differentials between them. So this goes on here uh, until everything is zero. And the spectral sequence means I have these differentials here and going from E1, to, to, from the E1 page to the E2 page means I take cohomologies of, the, of this complex and replace everything by the cohomology. And then I have, uh, <clears throat> have the next page and the next page is an E2, it's the E2 page. And there are the differentials going this way. And now uh, the, the Frölicher spectral sequence for a projective variety, a smooth projective variety degenerates. And that means in particular that uh, the, all, these in, all these differentials here are zero. And also the higher differentials are zero. And this in the end uh, leads to a, a decomposition uh, of the, of the, of the, um, of the, of the cohomology, what's written here on, on the right-hand side. So this was first not using this, this, the, the, this language of spectral sequences proved by Hodge already in, in 49. He used harmonic forms. I'll mention this a little later again as well. And the advantage of his analytic argument was that what you get is actually a, a natural decomposition. So the spectral sequence, even when it's degenerate, only gives you a filtration of this, of this final, final vector space here such that the graded uh, vector spaces, the graded parts of the filtration are these here, but it 
the R power doesn't give you a natural split of this, of this, um, which exists, but it's there's no natural split. And Hodge, the Hodge's um Hodge's proof actually gives you uh, gives you a natural decomposition. And then there is an algebraic um proof that typically is associated to a, a attributed to the linear UZ, but as they say themselves, there is in a prior algebraic proof around the same time, roughly by by Faltings. And the fantastic thing is uh, they prove uh, this uh, the uh, this decomposition here uh, for complex projective uh, varieties by passing to uh, to uh, varieties over over, the, over finite fields over P over FP or FQ uh, and and use the Frobenius there. This is this is very surprising because uh, the the similar spectral sequence over fields of positive characteristic doesn't degenerate. There's a condition you have an extra condition you have to put on, and then it degenerates, but in general it doesn't. So in this sense, the proof of um, of delinear UZ is quite surprising that they pass via characteristic P where the decomposition in general doesn't hold, and then still know enough in order to get the decomposition. Uh, there's a slight difference between Hodge's result and their result is they only show that the spectral sequence degenerate. That means there exists a decomposition without producing a distinguished decom de decomposition. So they only have a filtration again, filtration of this vector space, such that the graded objects of the filtration are, uh, are these vector spaces, whereas Hodge actually gives a natural decomposition. Okay, so what I want you to take uh, from this is if I have a complex projective variety, smooth complex projective variety, then I have a linear algebra structure, which is uh, is this package here. So they are finitely generated Z modules. If I pass to complex vector spaces, they come with a natural decomposition and a certain symmetry between the PQ and the QP part. Uh, okay, so now you you should ask, what is it good for? What can I do with this this structure? And I give you just uh, just uh, two examples, uh, and these are uh, uh, called Rayleigh theorems. And I give you uh, the standard one that's for, for curves. The standard one says, suppose you have two plane curves, like the ones before, like a Fermat, uh, Fermat plane curve and some other, some other, you take some other equation and you want to know whether these two curves are isomorphic. Okay, and the Torelli theorem says, well, they are isomorphic if and only if there's an isomorphism between uh, the first cohomologies. So these cohomology groups, we know what they are. They are isomorphic to uh, something like this. So they're free modules um, of rank given by the genus, two times the genus. So already uh, having an isomorphism like this tells you that these two curves uh, have to be the, have to have the same genus. And you want this isomorphism when you extend it to a complex linear map to map the one zero part which is a vector subspace of the complexification of this one to the one zero part on the other side. And then there's an extra condition, which I didn't write, but now I do. You want this to be compatible with the intersection product. I told you an algebraic curve over C can be viewed as a Riemann surface. That's the middle cohomology of a, of a two-dimensional real manifold, comes with an intersection form, and you want this isomorphism to be an isometry, so it should preserve the intersection form on the, on the two sides. And um, something similar happens for K3 services. This is the famous uh, road rate theorem uh, due to uh, Piatelsky, Shapiro, and Shapirovich. Uh, I only stated, like, say, for smooth quartic. So remember, there was the smooth Fermat quartic I gave you. Take any other quartic equation, assume it defines a smooth variety. And you again wonder when are these two uh, isomorphic? And the statement is well, if and only if there's an isomorphism between uh, these singular cohomologies. Which depend on the topological manifold structure, such that when I complexify, it maps the two zero part to the two zero part. And again, I have to add this condition that uh, this isomorphism is actually an isometry. Um, see, now I'm talking about complex surfaces that makes four dimensional real manifolds. So that's the middle cohomology. I have the intersection product in the middle cohomology of the four manifold. And I want this isomorphism to, com to be compatible with the intersection product. So what we have here is I associate some linear algebra structure on the right-hand side to something 
something concrete but complicated to, to study. This is so this is here geometry and this is linear algebra. And it says the Turet theorem says at least for these two classes of varieties, the linear algebra knows everything about, about the variety. So that's quite that's quite uh, that's quite uh, uh, quite amazing. It tells you that this Hodge decomposition that I explained to you comes from the spectral sequence uh, is all a little complicated, but in the end it's just linear algebra. But nevertheless, it, remem it, rem it, uh, it remembers the geometry behind. Okay, um, so let me just trace this uh, by these two boxes. So I started out with equations. So here I, I looked at these equations. Uh, the first one was this one. That was in P2, and then I gave you the Zermar quartic. Uh, and then uh, I associate to this uh, the hot structure, which is linear algebra. So here I have really geometry. And here I have linear algebra. And then I explained to you I can pass from here to here. Abstractly, that's maybe not so complicated, uh, but to do this in practice, it's actually quite complicated. So even for an easy equation like these ones or this one, to really write down the hot structure to describe it, that's typically fairly complicated. Um, okay. And now the Torelli theorem tells you sometimes, at least for these two types of varieties, you can also go the other way. The hot structure determines the equation, and that's even more complicated. So in principle, these two ready theorems, for instance, here for the for the quartics, they say they tell me if I know this structure, this hot structure of this middle commodity, I know the quartic, right? So in principle, you should be able to recover the equation or one equation for for the Fermat quartic from just its uh, linear algebra uh, structure given by the hot uh, uh, structure. And it's impossible. So there's no direct way to, to do this. There's something easy for Tori. I'll we'll come to Tori in a second. Uh, but for K-thesis, we don't know how to describe the K-thesis surface that, that is described, determined by a, by a specific hot structure. We just know that it's an abstract uh, theorem that determines it without being constructed. OK, uh, I'm going very slowly. Any questions so far? Okay, then let's go on. Um, so now I, I want to uh, say a little bit about geometry uh, without equations. Okay, uh, so uh, coming from algebra geometry, you know, uh, somehow you have the impression you can just write down arbitrary equations and each time you define a scheme or variety and then you can study it. And so there are plenty of, of these varieties around. So suppose now I forbid you to use equations and I still want you to describe complex manifolds of objective varieties. It's very hard. So I give you, I give you two examples. Um, the first one uh, is a complex torus. So you take, you, take, you take a complex vector space, Cn, and you divide out by gamma, where you assume that the gamma here is a lattice. So that means it's a Z module. So it's really a Z to the power 2n. And it's embedded into Cn such that the quotient here is really compact. And that just means that's embedded as a discrete, discrete subgroup of Cn. And that's a, that's a complex, uh, complex manifold. And the second example is the example of Hopf surface. It's kind of similar. Uh, instead of dividing out C2 or Cn, I take out the origin and then I divide out just by Z. And here's the operation of, uh, of the generator of Z. So I just send x, y to over half x and half y, okay? And you take the quotient, and again, uh, this uh, this is this is a compact complex manifold. So the compactness is 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 rather uh, easy to see, um, uh, but maybe I say uh, for those who have never seen the definition of uh, of a complex manifold, what a complex manifold is, okay? So. Remember what is a topological manifold? That's just some topological space which you can uh, cover by 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 charts, by open charts. Each chart is isomorphic to a homeomorphic or diffeomorphic to Rn, and then there are the translate uh, transition functions. If you have if you have two op two open charts, 
Oh, two open shards here. You identify so you identify this with some Rn, uh, and then the, the intersection here gives you a transition function. And you want this in the topological uh, category. You want this to be homeomorphisms. In the in the in the C infinity, you want this to be differentiable, and so on. And for complex manifolds, um, the condition is you can cover your manifold by charts. Now you don't assume that they are biolomorphic to Cn. You only assume that they are uh, biolomorphic to some disk or just identified with some disk. And and now you want the transition function to be holomorphic. That's a complex complex uh, manifold. So there are famous problems. Uh, you might wonder. You take your ease your your manifold, your favorite manifold, and you want to know the like, topological manifold, real manifold. Is it actually a complex manifold? For instance, you can ask, what about S1? So S1 cannot be a complex manifold because its real dimension is its real dimension is one, and since the complex vector space has real dimension two, that cannot never be a complex manifold. But S2 is a Riemann sphere. It's nothing but uh, but uh, but uh, P one, and there's a famous problem uh, that's called the Hopf problem, and it's this very simple question. Now you take S six, uh, and you ask, does this have a complex structure? And that's not known. What is not so clear is, I mean, it's a little annoying that we don't know this, uh, but it's not clear whether it's actually an interesting question. It's annoying that somehow we don't have the techniques to decide this, uh, but even if somehow uh, it turns out it has a complex structure, it's probably not a very interesting complex manifold. Uh, so it's maybe uh, just uh, just an annoying question, not very interesting. Um, okay, but I, I'll come back to, to this maybe a little later. Okay, so now the question is, suppose we have a complex manifold, for instance, given as a torus or given as, as, by as this quotient of the surface. And then the question is, uh, how, can I, how, do, how can I study this complex manifold? Is there maybe again something like a Turetti theorem? Um, and so we learned that it's interesting to look at the spectral sequence and the hot decomposition. So why not doing the same, the same thing here? So now we only assume X is a compact complex manifold and we still have, we still have the spectral sequence, okay? It does not need to generate, to generate. Uh, so it, it might be that the dimension of this vector space is not the sum of the dimensions on, on, the, on the left hand side. So what we want is we want this to degenerate and to, uh, because that was helpful to, to study uh, varieties, the manifolds that came from our varieties. So we would like to keep this. So we want, we want to study complex, uh, compact complex manifolds for which this spectral sequence degenerates. So in particular, we have the composition like this and with a sec extra structure. And this is then what's called a Hodge, uh, Hodge structure as we have seen the, the before. Okay. Uh, so now we can restrict to complex manifolds uh, that have, this, uh, that have this, this feature. So the first example, it's a little confusing is in dimension two, if I talk about a compact complex uh, surface, then it turns out Every compact complex surface uh, has this property. This uh, this this sequence always uh, this sequence always degenerates. So if the dimension is two, one is okay. I always always have this decomposition, but I don't have the the symmetry between the PQ part and the QP part. And the first uh, the first example is actually a Hopf surface. Oh, I didn't give you. Uh, maybe I should have done this. Let me add this here. Um, there's a topological characterization for the for the tori and the um, and the hop surface. The torus is topologically something very easy, namely it's uh, a product of s ones uh, two n times. And the hop surface is topologically also something very easy. It's uh, s one times s three. Okay. So topologically, they don't seem to be very different. Um, but it turns out um, that uh, the Hopf surface is a complex surface, so it does have this decomposition, but it has does not have the the symmetry between H one zero and H zero one. Okay, so it's it has decomposition, but not a hot structure.
So some of the hop services, uh, if, we, if we insist uh, to have the, uh, the Hodge theory at our disposal, then hop services are not, uh, are not good. Okay, now here comes the, the most important fact. Um, whenever I have a compact Kähler manifold, I haven't told you yet what a compact Kähler manifold is, but I will, then uh, I do have I do have the, the Hodge theory. So that means I have I have these two one and two hold. Okay. Um, in fact, I need something much uh, less, namely, or well, much less, but uh, it's a different it's a different flavor. I uh, if I have a compact Kähler manifold, there's uh, the so-called the del del bar lemma. This holds, and it's enough to assume the del del bar lemma holds uh, to to have uh, have Hodge theory at our disposal. Okay, so let me say I won't enter too much into into the definition of a Kähler manifold, but I, I feel I should give you at least the definition. But I start out with this this weaker condition of the del del bar lemma, just to give you a flavor of the kind of of condition uh, we encounter here. So here I'm writing the space of K forms, differentiable K forms with complex coefficients, right? Uh, so those decompose into the PQ parts. So that means if I have a K form, I can write it as a sum in a unique way of alpha PQs. And locally, each of these alpha PQs looks like it's a differential forms. And instead of writing this as dx1, dx2, and so on, I write this in dzs and dz bars. Because I, I have a complex structure, I can uh, I can instead of writing real imaginary part of a complex of a complex coordinate, I can write the complex coordinate and its complex conjugate, and then this induces the same for differential forms, and this gives me this decomposition in in forms that have p times the holomorphic coordinates and q times the anti-holomorphic coordinates. So the p is here, and the q is here. Okay. Um, so now assume uh, assume we have a form uh, alpha, which which is pure. It means it only has it only has this part one one pq part. Okay, I just ignore all the other ones and assume it's a closed form. Okay, and then we say that the del del bar lemma holds if now I write a bunch of conditions um, and let me only talk about the first and last one. Then the first condition is alpha is d exact. So that means alpha can be written as d of some beta. Okay. And the last condition is uh, that's why it's called the del del bar lemma. Alpha is del del bar exact. And that means uh, uh, um, alpha is del del bar of some form gamma. So here uh, the beta has to be p plus q minus one. And the gamma has to be p plus q minus two. Anyway, so uh, it's a, it looks like a technical condition, but for these degenerations of spectral sequences, I mean, it's a technical thing. So you need some technical assumption to make it degenerate. Okay. So this is the condition delta bar lemma holds. And I'll also briefly tell you what the scalar condition is. And it's not so clear why this comes in, in at this point. Uh, and I'll come back to this later. So all of a sudden, I'm not only talking about complex manifolds, I'm also talking about Riemannian manifolds. And uh, so we assume, so X is called Kähler, if there exists a Riemannian metric, G, and um, such that uh, the complex structure I uh, defining X is orthogonal to G. So what do I mean by this? So a complex manifold X is in particular a real manifold plus this notion of what is locally the, co the, the complex coordinate, and that's given by what's called a complex structure. So this is a complex structure. Just think of a complex vector space versus a real vector space. What's a complex vector space? It's a real vector space, plus the information, what it means to multiply by the imaginary unit, by i. And that's the multiplication by i in each tangent space. So that's the complex. And, uh, and and so if you want, the I is really an endomorphism of the tension bundle uh, to the tension bundle complex. And you you assume that this thing is uh, is 
is orthogonal with respect to the dynamic metric. And then you can cook out a, a two form. This is this omega, which is called the Kähler form. Which is nothing but uh, so it's G, it's a Riemannian metric, but the Riemannian metric is a certain tensor, but it's not a form; it's a symmetric thing. But once you you plug it in the complex structure, that becomes a two form, and you want this to be closed. That's the condition. Okay. And now there is one one interesting consequence of, of this already. Um, you see, if you have a Riemannian metric, uh, then you can talk about the volume form. The volume form integrated over your manifolds are always uh, some positive constant. And since there's this relation with the, between the Riemannian metric and the Kähler form, the um, the omega to the power n is actually a volume form. Um, and this implies that if you integrate this over x, then you get something uh, non-zero. And since omega is a closed form, uh, it defines a cohomology class, and its kth power defines a cohomology class of degree 2k. And since uh, this integral is zero, is, is non-zero, all these cohomology classes here are non-zero. Um, okay. Um, let me, oh, I can't do this here. Uh, this will allow us to, for instance, to exclude that S6 is a, uh, is a, is a killer man. Anyways, so this is, uh, you can either work with, uh, with uh, the Kähler structure, which is a little weird that all of a sudden there's a Riemannian geometry coming into the picture, but it simply, it simply works. Or you assume the del del bar lemma holds, which is a little technical, but only uses complex geometry. It doesn't make uh, the, any Riemannian structure come into the picture. In a way, some of the, assuming the del del bar lemma is the, not more natural, more natural condition, but it's also harder to harder to prove. Okay, so now I want to uh, discuss how I can possibly distinguish between uh, between projective manifolds and uh, Kähler manifolds. Okay, um, so let's let's first talk about projective manifolds. So here are uh, this this realm of projective manifolds. This is this red box here. Okay, so uh, the first thing uh, to mention here is there's a famous result by Kudaira, uh, the early 50s, who proves uh, a link between the projective manifolds. So these are these complex manifolds coming from smooth complex projective varieties and Kähler manifolds. And his statement is the following uh, um, uh, it acts as a compact complex manifold, it comes from a projective uh, variety, if and only if. Uh, there exists a Kähler structure on this, plus the additional uh, assumption that the Kähler form defines a cohomology class that is actually rational. Okay, so these cohomology classes here uh, were all in the complex numbers, but now I want this to be um, I want this to be a rational cohomology class. Okay, so uh, I'll discuss this in, in a second a bit more. But what you see already is that any projective manifold is in particular Kähler, okay? And then there's the additional condition. So that means uh, if I try to uh, look at the space of uh, all Kähler manifolds, it's strictly bigger. Every projective manifold is a Kähler manifold, but then potentially there can be other manifolds, other Kähler manifolds that are not, not projective, okay? So here, I just to recall the definition, projective means it comes from something that's embeddable into a projective space. Kähler is the condition uh, on this on this form omega to be closed, and then there are two further classes I want to mention. Uh, one is uh, Moisheson, or some also call this an algebraic uh, space, like space. Uh, and there's the is Fujiki. Let me only say something about Moisheson. It could happen um, that you have a complex manifold. That on a big open part looks like an algebraic variety, but itself is not algebraic, and that's what's a, what's a Moisheson uh, uh, variety. Uh, so it's birational; it's something that's birational to something projective. And then the same. So the analog for Kähler manifolds uh, of Moisheson is Fujiki, and that means it's every complex uh, compact complex manifold 
that uh, is bimeromorphic to kilometer photon. Yeah, we have a question in the chat. Ah, well, that's just uh, not what we mean. Okay, I, I'll come. I'll come back to the, this later. And then there's a, a last class which we discussed already. Um, uh, those complex manifolds which uh, for which I have the del del bar. So whenever I I am in this class here, uh, I know uh, uh, I have the Hodge theory applies. The spectral sequence degenerates, and I have the Hodge symmetry between HPQ and HGP. Uh, so it's not it's not completely trivial uh, that so there's this uh, this statement uh, this statement here that compact complex uh, Kähler manifolds uh, um, have Hodge uh, structures. Uh, so that this is okay for Kähler manifolds. I also say it's enough to assume the del del bar lemma. What is what is not so clear at this point is why Moish is on. So everything that's birational to something projective satisfies the del del bar lemma, and similarly why everything that's bimeromorphic to a Kähler manifold is uh, satisfies the. the in the, in the um, you could you could add other conditions uh, and see what it does. For instance, you could just add. Let us look at all the complex manifolds that do have this property that the Hodge Hodge three holds. Or Hodge three. Okay. Or I could just uh, assume that the um, <coughs> that the sec spectral sequence degenerates. All kinds of of uh, of, uh, of conditions, uh, but these are the most uh, most common ones. Let me just briefly uh, give you an idea about this theorem of uh, of Kodaira. What's the link between projective and Kähler? One direction that's the easy direction. If you have a complex manifold that comes from a, a projective variety, so it's something that lives in the end, you you look at something that's called the Fubini Studi metric. So remember um, the projective space. It's a quotient uh, of the vector space minus the origin. Okay, and the pullback of the Fubini study looks like uh, probably something like this: del del bar log z squared. That's a certain certain metric you can write down, and uh, we know the cohomology of a projective space very well. It turns out that its cohomology class uh, is in fact just the class of a hyperplane section, um, and it's that that's a Kähler form, uh, and the restriction of a Kähler form uh, remains Kähler, and that gives you that X is scalar. And the, the difficult part is is of course the other direction. So this is this is more difficult, and uses uh, vanishing. Okay, let's look at our two examples. Uh, complex uh, tori. So I, I described for you complex tori just as a quotient of, of, of vector space by lattice. And it turns out it's always scalar, but not always projective. So that's important. It's not always projective. Okay, at least once the dimension is, is uh, at, least, uh, at least two. So in fact, most of these complex tori are not projective. Um, and something similar happens uh, for K3 surfaces. Uh, I have given you only an example of K3 surfaces, namely the Fermat quartic or any other quartic in, P, in P3. Uh, but it turns out uh, there are K3 surfaces that are not projective, uh, but it's very hard to describe them. So we don't know how to describe them as explicitly as complex tori. They're not quotients of anything nice you can write down. We just know they exist there, they are there. But we, we have never not in a way we have never seen those with some exceptions. Okay. So let's look at low dimensions. Um, uh, what happens uh, with this, these various types of manifold scalar, projective, Fujiki, Moishizon in low dimensions? Luckily, in dimension one, everything is the same. Complex, projective, scalar, uh, that's also Moishizon, everything is uh is scalar because the project is the same as scalar and scalar is the same as complex. And by definition, Fujiki and Moishi, these are complex manifolds. So everything is the same in dimension one. So they are uh, Riemann surfaces. So these are uh, Riemann, complex Riemann surfaces. In dimension two, the situation is a little bit more interesting. Uh, uh, once again, uh, there's no difference between projective and uh, and. Uh, 
there's no difference between projective and Moishizun. And similarly, there's no different, no difference between Kale and Fujiki. Remember, Moishizun was everything that looks like a projective manifold on a big open set. Fujiki is everything that looks like, uh, like a Kehler manifold on a big open set. So in they are both, not, there's no difference because everything is so smooth. Uh, and, um, uh, but projective still implies scalar that always holds, but the other direction is not true. Okay. And, and of course, uh, there are also uh, complex manifolds that are not, uh, that are not uh, scalar. And I, uh, oops. Let me first talk about how to this, how to see, uh, whether a complex manifold could be Kehler or, or not. Okay, so this is the question: When is uh, when is a complex manifold Kehler? Well, when it is Kehler, uh, we can say at least two things right away. One is the odd Betty numbers are all uh, 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 even dimensional. For instance, look at H one. So the dimension of this space is the first Betty number, and this decomposes into H one zero. Uh, plus H01, because uh, we have the odd decomposition, because we assume the manifold scalar. And these two are complex conjugate to each other. And hence, they have the same dimension. And that means uh, the dimension of this space here is the dimension plus of this one plus the dimension of this one, so twice the dimension of this, so it has to be even. And similarly, uh, for the even cohomologies, you find uh, this, is, uh, this is the result uh, I mentioned here. There's always some power of the Kähler form of the Kähler class inside the even cohomology. So the even cohomology is, um, is always non-zero. So um, this first condition that the even uh, Betty numbers, uh, the odd Betty, odd Betty numbers are even, this, X, this shows us that off surface is not Kähler. Remember I told you, uh, where is it? Uh, where is my here, I told you, uh, I don't have Hodge decomposition. H10, H01 are not complex conjugate to each other. B1 is not even dimension, is not even, so the Hopf surface is not Kähler. And if you look at the second petty number of the sphere, S6 is zero, so it cannot be a Kähler manifold. Okay. So that's maybe also why, I'm, why I don't care so much about this famous Hopf problem, whether S6 is a complex manifold or not, because I'm, as an algebraic geometer, I'm interested in algebraic varieties and possibly Kähler manifolds, but everything beyond. Is maybe less interesting. Okay, so what happens uh, with this uh, distinction between compact and uh, compact complex and compact Kähler in dimension two? Um, it turns out there's a very nice criterion that tells you exactly once you know the cohomology, you can say whether the, the surface is Kähler or not. And this is this criterion: the Kähler surface is Kähler if and only if the first Betty number is even. That's a purely topological condition. It's the Betty number. If the Betty number is even, then this is uh, Kähler. There was a classical theorem by just using the whole classification theory of by Kodaira and Enriquez of all the surfaces and just going through the classification, you find you can find this result. The most interesting case is maybe the case of K3 surfaces. It's the famous theorem of, uh, of Seal that every K3 surface is actually K3. Um, so that's that's an old story, and only at the end of uh, the nineties uh, there was a more conceptual proof that uh, by Buchdahl and Lamarie using more complex analysis and without using the classification they could prove the same result. A Kähler surface is surface is Kähler if and only if B one is even. So in in higher dimensions, uh, this is uh, this is completely uncharted territory. Oops. Um, <clears throat> uh, for instance, there are plenty of questions. How can we decide, uh, how can we understand the difference between Kähler manifolds and the del del bar lemma? So I told you uh, every Kähler manifold uh, implies the del del bar. Oops. Right. Every Kähler manifold implies the del del bar lemma. But what about the converse? Is there maybe, a, a comp is every complex manifold for which this del del bar lemma is also Kähler? And the answer is uh, uh, no. Um, um, uh, that's an example of, of uh, Leonaga. 
Um, also, the question is how to distinguish between Fujiki and and Kela. Uh, it's it's not it's not it's not so clear. And then the, the, finally, the question how to distinguish between projective and Kela. Uh, and that's a very interesting question. I'll come back to this. For instance, you could ask if I look at all fundamental groups. So we know B one of a hot, of Kela manifold, B one of a projective manifold are both even. Uh, the H one is always the abelianization of the fundamental group. So you now you can ask if somehow the first cohomology groups, uh, the first cohomology groups I can get from projective manifolds and those can, I can get from uh, Kähler manifolds are the same. What about the fundamental groups? And so that's the question: Is every pi one of a Kähler manifold also pi one of a projective manifold? And that's not known. Okay. Uh, I forgot one thing I wanted to so I have to tell you this. Uh, I'm sorry, in this diagram here, this is uh, this very important result uh, that goes back to Moishe's own effect uh, that clarifies the link between uh, uh, Moishe's own and, and projective. The projective manifolds, those here, are exactly those that are Kehler and Moishe's own. So the intersection of Moishe's own and Kehler is projective. So in particular, if you have a Moisel manifold that is projective, then it is on it is Kehler that is already projective. So in, in, in particular, all those Moisel manifolds, they satisfy the delta del bar lemma, but they are not Kehler. And this is uh, this is this example I alluded to here in Ibanaka. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, wanted to say something about deformations. Um, I could stop here or go on for 10 more minutes. Daniel? Uh, well, it, uh, the, the talk is two hours, so you can... Ah, okay, okay. I, I won't talk for two hours. No, okay. Then I go on a little bit. No, no, I won't talk. Yeah, 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 sure, sure. Okay, good. Okay. So then let me talk a little bit about deformations because that's uh, another principle. So you see the theme of this talk... Uh, the theme of this talk is um, I want to motivate why we have to pass, why and how we have to we pass from projective manifolds to Kähler manifolds. Why is it is it too restrictive to only work with projective manifolds? Uh, and the first principle was, well, since for projective manifolds, it's so useful to have this spectral sequence degenerate and then this Hodge symmetry so that they can have, have work with Hodge theory, which is just linear algebra datum. Um, I want to keep this for everything I, I want to I, I generalize. So for Kähler manifolds or manifolds with delta bar lemma. And now the second principle is uh, I want to understand what happens under deformations. Uh, that means I start with the projective manifold and start deforming the complex structure a little bit. So let me tell you what this means. Okay, so I first explain what is a deformation. So I so uh, maybe a deformation of yeah, let's say let's first say deformation. So deformation is something like this. I start with a complex manifold X. I call it denote curly X plus a holomorphic map onto some onto some disk. It can be bigger, but let's say it's, it's going onto onto a disk. And I want this map somehow to be holomorphic, and I want this to be a submersion. So I call this uh, smooth. So that's the same thing as. The differential subjective at each point. So that's uh, submersion. And I also want all the fibers to be proper. So all fibers are compact, all fibers. So what does it mean? It means uh, for each point in my disk downstairs, I have a complex manifold. So this is a family of compact complex manifolds, okay? But it, it means a little, little bit more. It means they are they are somehow bound together in a in a family like this. It's just not just a set of complex manifolds, but they sit in one one family. For instance, one consequence of of this thing is that all all the all these complex manifolds are actually uh, isomorphic, diffeomorphic to each other, and particularly homeomorphic. And that's uh, that's the famous theorem of oops. Of years, man.
all the fibers look topologically, analytically, it's infinity uh, uh, the, the same. It's just the complex structure, the way we glue these charts by holomorphic functions that that changes in this in the semi. Okay, um, so there are two phenomena. Uh, this phenomena we uh, one one um, uh, one encounters. Uh, so this is the, the question: How does projective behaves under deformation? So here's the first. Uh, uh, phenomenon. The, the first one is there exist deformations like this. I can even assume that this, this disk here is in C, so it's really a disk in the in the project in the complex plane, such that all the fibers uh, are projective, so that all the fibers not over the over the origin, except for the the fiber of the origin. So uh, we we are interested in in projective manifolds. And you deform your projective manifolds. We are all happy. We can describe everyone by equations. And all of a sudden, over the origin, it becomes something we cannot describe by equations anymore. Okay, and that's kind of bad uh, because we, as algebra geometers, want to describe things by by polynomial equations. But we have to deal with this fact that there is a limit of complex projective manifolds that is not algebraic anymore. This is not this cannot be described by equations as a subset of a projective space. Okay, um, and this explains why uh, why we need Moisson. So the first example was uh, was due to uh, constructed by uh, by Hironaka, uh, and that <coughs> led him to introduce these slightly more general class of of uh, of geometric objects, which are called either, either algebraic spaces or Moisson Moisson uh, manifolds. And the second example is you can have a following phenomenon. You, you have a family again. Again, we can assume for simplicity that's a disk in, in C. And now the opposite happens. Um, only the fiber of a zero is projective. Should be something Only the fiber, the center fiber is projective. So take your 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 like the fermat quartic and P3, this K3 stuff I gave you. And then you can find a deformation of this such that all the other ones, or most of the other ones, let's say, are, are not projective. Okay. Again, you know, you start with something like the Fermat quartic in P3. You're happy, you have one equation, very easy. And then you change the complex structure a little bit, and all of a sudden you cannot describe it by, by equations anymore. And this happens frequently. Um, uh, and uh, and uh, for and for instance, for K3 services, this is this this the case of the Fermat quartic I gave you, but also for tori, or more generally for uh, for hyperkähler manifolds. Uh, so one, this first phenomenon led to the invention of Moisson uh, spaces, and the other one forces us to consider Kähler manifolds. Well, at least it forces us to consider certain general com generalized complex manifolds, so generalizations of projective manifolds. Which, uh, uh, as we will see in a second, happen to be happen to be killer. At least it forces us to make our our category of projective manifolds a bit more flexible. Okay, now there are plenty of questions uh, you 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 can ask. For instance, suppose you have two complex manifolds. So uh, uh, these are both compact complex manifolds. And assume they look topologically or as real manifolds the same. So they are diffeomorphic to each other. Let's say they're diffeomorphic. It's a very strong assumption. And you want to know whether they're actually uh, deformations of each other. So that means, uh, so I, I, this is what's called deformation equivalence. That means, uh, let me write this here. This means uh, there exists an X over delta such that X is one fiber and x, uh, x prime is another fiber. Maybe you have to allow a couple of disks somehow to, to go from x to x uh, to x prime, but that would be that would be the question. It's a very nice question uh, because we know the converse. If you have deformation equivalent complex manifold, they are by Ehrsman theorem, as I just recalled here, they are diffeomorphic, and you want to know is the opposite also true. It's not so easy to come up with counterexamples, but the answer is no. Okay. Also, you could ask, suppose 
suppose you start with a Kähler manifold, is there always uh, an X prime uh, projective, which is deformation equivalent to the, to the X, uh, to the original X? So you see, I, I told you, well, I have, we have to study Kähler manifolds because it can happen that I have a family like this where the central fiber is projective, but the other ones are not. And that's bad, so we should take those on, on board as well. But those, of course, by construction, they have the family that they, uh, uh, um, uh, that they appear as deformations of a projective manifold. So they're deformation equivalent to a projective manifold. And in a way, we are only interested in those. You could argue, maybe you're not, maybe you're interested, you're broader minded and you want, want to study all complex manifolds, all killer manifolds, but coming from algebraic geometry, uh, a good reason to start to study killer manifolds is comes from, from this phenomenon. And this only forces you to study killer manifolds that are deformation equivalent. We'll give you. And the answer is also no, yeah? And there's a famous result uh, by uh, Claire Bozin from, uh, from 2003. That says um, there exist Kähler manifolds, compact Kähler manifolds, such that the complex the complex cohomology ring is not isomorphic to any complex uh, any cohomology ring of any uh, projective manifold. So this is as a as a ring as a Q algebra. Wait a few. In particular, of course, x and x prime are not diffeomorphic. So there definitely exist Kähler manifolds that are not diffeomorphic, not even homeomorphic to, uh, to projective manifolds. And in a way it tells you, maybe we have introduced the class that's too broad a generalization of projective manifolds, um, who knows? Okay. Um, so I come, oops, what happened here? Uh, <laughs> I come back um, to my, my diagram. Remember, this is the diagram we, we considered before. Um, I have my projective manifolds, I have my Kähler manifolds, I have my marginal manifolds, and I have my Fujiki manifolds. And now I want to study these four classes from the perspective how they behave under deformations. Okay, what does it mean? There are two questions. Whether a certain property, for instance, projective or Moishizan, is closed under deformations or is open under deformations. Okay, let me go back to these two examples here. You see here, I have an example where all the fibers are projective, but the special fiber is not. That means that the property to be projective is not closed. It holds here for an open subset, namely the punctured disk, but it doesn't necessarily imply it holds for all the fibers. So projective is not a closed condition, okay? Here is the opposite. Here I have one fibers projective, but that doesn't mean that all the fibers nearby in an open subset are projective, okay? Uh, so that means projective is also not an open condition. So let me put this here. This implies projective is not not closed, and this implies projective <coughs> is not open. Okay, so now this is what I wrote in this in this diagram here. Um, just look look at, at this the first case. These are our these are the manifolds we interested. Projective is neither is neither open nor closed. Yeah. And the examples, it's not open because I told you I can deform uh, the quartic Fermat surface a little bit and it stops being projective, the same for, for torus. Um, and there are these examples by Hironaka uh, where I just gave you where the special fiber is not, not projective anymore. So it's not closed. Okay. Now, what about uh, these moisture zone manifold? Recall moisture zone men, it looks, it's birational to a to an algebraic to projective manifold. So big open set is like an open set of a projective manifold. Um, it's again, not, uh, not, uh, not open. Uh, this is harder to construct. These are examples by Campana 
and Lebrun Poon. And it is expected and almost proved that it's closed under specialization. So if you have a family over disk, all the fibers are moisture uh, except possibly the fiber of the origin. Then also the fiber of the, of the, of the origin is moisture zone. It looks like on an open set, like a projected map. So this, the, there are results by Popovici and then there's a version of this by Raoul Tsai, which essentially proves this. So this, uh, the, the paper by Popovici is a 10 year old uh, paper in Invenciones. It essentially proves this under some mild assumptions. Um, uh, so, for instance, if you assume that the delta bar lemma holds for the central fiber, then uh, then uh, it uh, he actually proves that this condition is closed. Okay, let's say Kähler. Um, the Kähler condition is an open condition. If you have one Kähler manifold and then you deform it a little bit, it stays a Kähler manifold. That is not so obvious at all. Uh, that's a result by uh, by Kudara. Uh, because you need, you remember the Kähler condition was there was a Riemannian metric, and then you could have two form of this, and then the condition was that this two form had to be closed, okay? And closed to something closed is, a, is I mean, the differential form is closed, is a, is a closed condition. You could, you could imagine differential forms that depends on a parameter, and for a certain value of the parameter, the differential form is closed, and for other parameters, it's not. So it's not at all clear that this holds, but that's a result of Kudaira. So Kähler manifolds uh, are, uh, are, uh, uh, are Kähler property is an open condition. I don't know why uh, I put this in my room. Anyway, the Kähler condition is not uh, is not closed. That's again uh, this this uh, this this example by. Uh, by um, Hironaka, the same reason why moisture zone is not, is not, uh, I'm sorry, no. Uh, yeah, and so, yeah, this is the same reason why projective is not, is not, is not closed. Because you see, you, you take this, this example of Hironaka, uh, Hironaka where the special fiber is moisture zone, uh, but not projective, and then it cannot be Kela either, because I told you Kela and moisture zone implies projective. So, and finally, Fujiki, uh, Fujiki condition is not, is not an open condition. Again, this is Campana uh, and Lebron Poon. And we expect this is closed. There are papers in this direction, but this has not been apparently not completely settled. We expect Fujiki is, is closed. So you see each of these four classes, I mean, projective seems very bad. It's neither an open condition nor a closed condition. Uh, Moisture zone is not open, but so we hope it's a closed condition. Kela is an open condition, but not closed. And uh, Fujiki, uh, we expect it to be closed, but it's not open. So each has its all has its advantage and disadvantage. The delta bar property, so manifolds for which the delta bar lemma holds, that seems to be quite a nice class, uh, in the sense that we do have openness. Uh, strangely enough, I only found this in a recent PhD thesis. I would have expected this to be known much longer, but um, so that's by, by uh, Angela, that's my source I have. And, but nothing is known, it seems, about the closeness. Um, uh, I would, personally, I would expect it's closed under, under, um, under deformations. Uh, and I don't really see what, so I have an argument, I don't see why, why it doesn't work, but apparently the specialist uh, uh, think it's not so, not so obvious. And then you can ask for other properties. I said, why stopping here? Maybe we'll just look at complex manifolds uh, for which the spectral sequence degenerates. Uh, and again, it's easy to see that's an open condition, uh, but it turns out it's not a closed condition. And so <clears throat> okay. So the question, uh, the question remains: uh, Is there is there uh, a condition? <coughs> oh, maybe I should. I'm sorry. Maybe I should add one more thing here. Um, there are two, so we started out with projective manifolds, and then we generalized this to Kähler manifolds and to moisture zone manifolds. And there were two reasons for this. The reason um, to add Kähler manifolds, this was uh, we needed we needed uh, uh, needed that small deformations of projective manifolds. Uh, um, 
uh, uh, it's an open condition. And then the other the other uh, generalization was needed in order to get uh, to get closed. And and this generalization here from projected to Moishison happens again here from Kela to Fujiki. And this this open this 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 error here from projective to Kela is the same passage as from Moishis on to Fujiki. Uh, okay. And so uh, maybe um, um, maybe I actually can can uh, can stop here. Uh, the question that remains is uh, we happened so historically we happened to generalize. So we all agree projective varieties are something nice. We want to understand projective varieties. Uh, then it turns out we have to make the notion a little bit more flexible to uh, uh, to allow so to allow uh, certain deformations and certain deformation properties. Um, uh, and then it, it, historically, it was handy to have this notion of a killer manifold, which seemed to fit the bill immediately very nicely. Uh, because if I have a killer manifold, I have Hodge theory, and everything behaves very similarly to uh, to projective manifolds. But maybe uh, we were a little bit too generous uh, by by taking taking this accepting this definition of a killer manifold. Maybe we need a more restrictive notion. Uh, the notion that is we only want a notion that's for that we can that's inevitable that we have to adopt when we start with projective manifolds. And and uh, this famous result by uh, by Claire Voisin tells us that killer manifolds in general are too far away from projective manifolds. They might not have anything to do with our projective manifolds we are interested in. And the question is, what is the what is the geometric condition that characterizes all deformations of projective manifolds? Okay, Kehler is on the one hand too uh, too generous. Uh, because uh, because of this Voisin example, but on the other hand, also maybe too restrictive because we know uh, certain specializations of projective manifolds will be Moishe zone and not Kela. So there is a question. It seems we need we need a class that cuts a little bit uh, 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 diagonally in this in this diagram, and there is no good notion that has been has been put forward to uh, to that would fit this um, this bill. Okay, uh, uh, I had prepared a little bit about the Hodge conjecture, but actually maybe I think it's uh, enough information at this point already. And I stop here, but I'll be happy to take any questions uh, anyway.